My name's Chris Jones. I work for a small company called Novalia, um, based in Cambridge, um, as Marcus described. My entire background is a print industry before I accidentally got involved with Novalia around about 15 years ago. This is Novalia. Um, we're a Cambridge startup. Um, not a Cambridge University spin out, but Kate Stone up in the top left hand corner there accidentally came out the Cavendish with a PhD in semiconductor physics a long time ago. Um, and she started working for a company called Plastic Logic. Again, another Cambridge name of its age. Plastic Logic were looking to develop at the time um, display technologies. They still exist in some type of form with, uh, with Flex Enable over on the Science Park. But Kate started working with Plastic Logic, I think, around, around about 1999, 2000. Um, <clears throat> She was interested in print. She became very interested in print as a manufacturing method for electronic things. Um, I ran into her accidentally back in around about 2004 originally when I was developing conductive inks. Um, ran into her again about 2009 and Kate had developed this company called Novalia. Um, the first person she hired, I'll go on to what we do, but the first person she hired was um, a graphics designer. And the small team that we kind of pulled together all come from very, very different, diverse backgrounds. So we've got electronic engineers, we've got software engineers, we've got designers. I think I'm pushing it with my background in chemistry, but I know a little bit about the print industry. Um, I'll give you the context of the print. So we're printing conductive inks. Um, not using digital processes or inkjet processes, um, using traditional impression. But we're printing conductive ink now on production machines. I don't own a printing press, no desire to because they're expensive equipment and they're quite hungry beasts and to keep them going 24 seven and make them pay for each other, uh, pay for themselves, then you've got to keep loading them. Um, I work with the external print industry with people who own these machines, who've got experts who are operators of that machinery, who know the process very, very well. I provide some interesting conductive ink that we've developed to run on the presses. They do a piece of print production to us. Um, question then is what we do with the conductive print. My presentations always descend into complete chaos, so I'll run a video, but then I'll hand things around. So effectively, we create printed panels or printed items that recognize where people are touching because of the conductive ink. Yeah, please do. Make sure they're awake. I work in an office full of people who are developing and playing with this, so I'm well used to working in a noisy environment. Yeah, yeah, fill your boots, absolutely. Please. So if we can recognize where people are touching on a piece of paper or, or a printed substrate, um, I'll pass these around. These are just prints show the sensors that we could be creating. Oh God, I didn't realise there was audio up for that as well. Oh, that's the audio out there. <laughs> right. <coughs> so one of, the, one of the panels going round, it's got some big black printed touch points on, and effectively we're printing discrete touch points. So if somebody touches there, electronic recognises that button number one has been pressed, and creates the output for whatever button number one has been described to do. This is something we've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, the second sensor that's going around. This is just like working in the office, actually, the noise in the background. Effectively, we're, pr we're printing um, a, a two-layer array. So it, it's printed, uh, we're printing on a flexo press. We're printing a series of horizontal lines. We're putting a laminate layer over the top on the fly. And then we're printing a series of vertical lines. And when connected up to our electronics and our software, we can recognize We've basically created a matrix, so we've got the touch technology of an iPad screen. It's just on a, a bit of polyester that's basically a shampoo bottle label, produced on the shampoo bottle label press, but it's got delusions of grandeur and can do interesting things. <coughs> so if we recognize the touch on the label, obviously we can, we can map it out to be a QWERTY keyboard or an AZERTY keyboard. All of this happens in the software. We can create dials. We can, we can let's create a couple of examples here. So we can recognize where it's been touched in real time. We can re recognize lots of fingers, more fingers actually than an iPad cat. We, we were developing this during the pandemic. 
And I had one engineer at home working on his own, and he was like, Chris, this is fantastic. I can recognize where 10 fingers are independently. He didn't have any family, so he was over the moon. And it was about three or four months later, and we had three of us in the office for the first time. Started off keeping a good distance, and suddenly we're recognizing we can recognize 30 fingers and the size of people's palms. And basically, these are all just bits of data. This is what's interesting. Um, I think the other video, we just got it mapped out to be a dial, effectively. I was complaining that stereo on my car was a digital volume up and up, volume down, which was great when I was arriving home late in the evening. I got the stereo on full blast and the roof off during the summer, and then I closed the roof up and get to the car first thing in the morning. And I'd have to wait for the stereo to gradually catch up and the software to run. In the meantime, whatever I was playing the previous night at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm driving out, and it's up at 98% of whatever the volume was. So we created a, um, the fact that you could instantly dial it back down to 1 or 0 and not annoy the neighbors as much. And of course, what you're seeing with the bits of print and the fact that it's a, it's a label, I can embed it on curved surfaces, which is kind of nice. So we were showing this at CES at the beginning of the year. I don't particularly like electric scooters or electric bikes, particularly in myself, but somebody came up and they were, I pretended to be interested in what they were talking about because that's what they do for a living. But they instantly started playing with that. Actually, this is the clean version. Somebody else came up and saw it as a really, not an application that I ever really wanted to get into or ever intended getting into, but the guy with the electric scooter recognized it as being um, an ele electronic um, e-bike e e or e-scooter throttle, just fitting it into the handlebars. That's what we do. I'm here to talk about AI. And I've been bending the ear of the team as to what we are. I, I'm not an engineer. I know a bit about print, but I work with some clever people. Um, I've got designers who are writing code. Designers don't normally write code. They, our engineers would write code. This is an example of something she did recently. Apologize about the production on the video. I'm renowned for dreadful videos, but she was basically back to what Elizabeth was presenting in terms of AR. Um, she was connected up to an AR engine, and basically the touch panel, again, it's difficult to video when there's just one person working on their own in an office in London, but the touch panel's affecting what animals come out in the AR environment. She hadn't written a bit of code in her life, but she'd um, created the connections between different platforms and the various platform through um, using some type of AI to generate the initial code. So it accelerated what we were able to do for, as a demonstrator for a client very, very quickly. Here's another thing wasn't written by an engineer. Actually, in fairness, this code has been modified a little bit by the engineers. Oh, that's that, not this. I know this video starts off, so I didn't do much editing in the video. Yay, it works. So basically, we've got a poster here on the wall. It connects through Bluetooth to a little hub that's connected to the internet, but basically, the code that was connecting to the internet we already had, but making that connect to a web page so in real time we can register, um, we can register votes. So effectively collating data from the public anonymously. The key thing is anonymously in that the phone is only being used as a method of presenting the data to the public or to, to users. Um, we're not monitoring who's putting what information in and the information they're putting in there, but anonymously, anonymously we can collate data from a marketplace of users. I'm going to go back into the, this is how long we've been around. 2020, 2012, and Facebook was a thing, but it, it wasn't a thing on your phones, per se. We used to access Facebook by, I, I went through memory lane digging out this image, the images of this in live action. We did a, 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 quite an ephemeral demonstrator for somebody who wanted to, wanted to try and generate, if you put certain inputs into a poster, so we created a poster that asked, asked this is on the basis of another project we'd done beforehand. Um, asked a series of multiple choice questions and would log the answers. Then for no particular reason, it took the answers, sent, uh, uh, it took the answers, transmitted them via Bluetooth to a computer, and the computer uploaded onto Nevada's Facebook page. Depending upon how the questions were answered, it would recognize your, recommend your favorite cake on the Facebook page. It was silly, as it was ephemeral, but it was a demonstration at the time of data capture. We were passing through an algorithm. The top right-hand corner there is the entire script for if you answer A, C, B, and D, it would spit out a lemon cheesecake, for example. So we hard-coded that. Scrolling forward, we did, we did another project, and this was kind of based on, um, at the time, when I was a kid, computer games existed, but if you weren't anywhere near a computer or couldn't be bothered waiting eight minutes for the software to load, <clears throat> you had these books. 
and it would describe the situation. And if you want to go to the dungeon on the left, turn to page 53. If you want to go to the one on the right, turn to page 147. And you could cheat really well by keeping your finger in the page of the book, flip back, and then take the option that didn't kill you. But again, we, we, create, we, we created a piece of software at the time. We, we've updated that recently. We called it an, an adventure engine. But basically, we can pre-prescribe. We can create an algorithm. So the user of a, a poster or a piece of marketing, it could take them through a journey. Um, it could take them to specific endpoints to recommend products, but we hard code that in, in the way that these adventure books did do. What we're on with at the moment, this is quite exciting, we're on with the moment of creating um, an adventure engine that actually we're not predefining outputs. I'll click forward. We're taking it through so that it's in a sandboxed environment. So our customers might be, um, might be brands. They want to inf create information about products. So we create a sandboxed environment with the right type of information in there. But we're basing things on a chat engine. Again, the information database is controlled. It might be doing external lookup to, to be able to retrieve information from the internet in certain in instances. Firing that back to text for speech. Welcome to Novalia's interactive This is simulated poster. completely. Touch number one if you would like to locate a nearby store. Touch number two if you would like to so find course, a nearby with restaurant. Chat AI, <clears throat> you can type touch in a lot of information three, if you would and give like very, to get very specific to wordy feedback. What we're trying to do is change four, that, if you that would wordy like input from a, from a potential facilities. user into being nearby food establishments include Billy's Burger Shop. Touch into a conversation number one that's not for Pierre's Michelin starred restaurant. Touch number two for Simon Sashimi Shack. Touch number three and touch number four for banging burritos. Or touch the red. Hello, I'm a smart poster. I think the other thing that's interesting is that we put multiple languages. Again, I've done this many times where we create multiple languages on a single poster, a single interface, and we've had to um, get hold of somebody who speaks Spanish very, very well, or get hold of somebody who speaks French very, very well, and recorded the audio files. All of these are run through an AI uh, translate text to speech translator, and they put accents on. They put local accents and understand the difference in accent between. Um, Catalonian Spanish to the, the accent to Mexican Spanish, and I find that fascinating, and it can be doing that on the fly. Something that we're playing with at the moment that's not actually in our products, but I was showing the XY sensor. Um, something that I never realized coming from a print background, and I'm only beginning to play with and understand now with the design team that I work with. <coughs> I've had an iPad for a long time, and my son, my son learned, to, learned to, his letters on an iPad screen, and he learned how to swipe things away. Um, on a screen before you actually knew how to turn on and off on a button. Um, but different people interact with different screens in different ways. So we're creating gestures in the XY sensor that I've handed around. Actually, I'm really quite intrigued in that the hand span of my hand is completely different to my son's hand, and being able to recognize, not necessarily biometric data per se, but, but to recognize different users or recognize that users are different if, they're, if different people are working on the same, um, same surface. Also, if you're touching a surface on the horizontal, the area of your finger is different than if you're touching something on the vertical. I have no idea about this. I'm learning about it. But being able to recognize an individual's gestures, um, perhaps how somebody scrolls on a, an iPad screen might be very different to how other people do. And being able to take inferences with that that affect how Nevada's um, technology puts outputs to the devices we work with. I think there's a lag in the button. And something I keep running into, again, I don't necessarily love AI in lots of ways as well. Um, I presented at a couple of shows over the last couple of years. I keep getting emails suggesting that I should use their lead generation software. And I've noticed over the past, certainly the past 12 months, the spam email I get is becoming progressively much more sophisticated. It kind of knows that I was in Vegas at the beginning of the year. It kind of knows that certain customers. Um, and it gets very arsy in a very human way. If I've not responded to them in five, three or four weeks, the follow-up emails are not necessarily arsy, but they're, they're very human. They're, you might be busy. I realize you might be busy. It'll only take you two moments. I find that intriguing. I, I think that's only going to develop and get more sophisticated. It gets harder to recognize the thing that isn't real messages, isn't real uh, communication somebody I'm already dealing with from effectively phishing exercises. I thought I'd fire in towards the end. Nothing to do with what Navalia were doing, but just interesting observations. Back in 96, I remember this because I was playing with the internet and was incredibly excited about the internet, which feels a long time ago. Bill Gates wrote a whole essay on the fact that content is king. And we watched over the last 20 odd years the fact that content has been king. My son comes home and explains that 
influencer is a job and that people are creating content. They get an income. They derive an income actually writing things and publishing through the internet. What Gates had in mind was that we were able to sit at home. We were able to write something, create something as artists, as creators, publish on the internet, and perhaps find ways of monetizing that. And I'm finding it terrifying, tearing, staring down both barrels of the fact that I'm a musician. I write songs. I'm, I record music with, with real instruments. And in 30 seconds, I can create a piece of music just clicking a couple of buttons. The volume's not great. It's recorded probably better than I could do with setting up mics and so on. That's better. Um, it's composing in a key. It's, it's, do, it's doing things against algorithms. That's creative, perhaps, in one way, if I'm not a musician. Um, I do find it terrifying the amount of time that I spent learning how to play the guitar compared to what can be done with a couple of clicks. You can play the keyboard better than I can, though. Scroll forward. This is a cracking one. Um, as I say, I write songs. I play the guitar. It's a band that I've followed for a few years. Colin Malloy's a songwriter. The band are called The Decemberists. It's just an interesting example um, that I watched happening in real time. He writes a blog, and he decided to have ChatGPT write a, a song by his band. So it, it took him a very short period of time. Write a song that Colin, Colin Malloy or The Decemberists might have written. So it came out with a load of lyrics that make reference to the type of things the Decemberists would have done, and he puts a whole load of narrative in his blog around this, but actually, the lyrics are just part of a song. Write me a chord sequence. So it does an absolute craftsman-like effort to write a chord sequence, but you've got to tie the two together, so be asked it to do that. Here's a meta bit. Hopefully this will play. So this is a song that's entirely written by clicking a few, or typing a couple of inputs into a chat GPT um, engine. That's Colin Malloy's voice, he's singing it, he's playing the guitar to it, he's recorded it analog. And it sounds like the Decemberists, it is the Decemberists. It's, it's not particularly good re recording on, the, on my file here. But then I particularly like, this is going full circle again, I particularly like his comment for the record. This is a particularly, re sorry, a remarkably mediocre song. I wouldn't say it's a terrible song, although it really flirts with terribleness. And he goes on to kind of expand a little bit on that. And the thing that I absolutely love is, he plays with words, he writes interesting lyrics. I like reading that because I can tell that he's written it. That's his personality and how he's written it. That's not been generated by a piece of artificial intelligence yet. And, and it's, possible to, it's possible to taste the difference between, at the moment, it's possible to taste the difference between creativity that's come through some type of AI or chat, certainly chat GPT I can taste and I can feel and I can see colleagues' um, LinkedIn posts and I can recognize that it's been not created by them or their personality. Um, this is out of date already. This is the last couple of months and, and articles on the BBC about AI that when I knew I was going to be presenting here, I thought I'd collate bits and pieces together. Treading into, I think Elizabeth and, um, and Matt were talking about creating content. Um, I'm a member of the Stationers and, and I'm racking back into one of the history of the Stationers company. And in the UK, the Stationers control copyright back in, the, back in the 18th century. They managed, if you wrote a book, you'd lodge a copy with the stationer's company, and that would effectively control, your, uh, uh, control the copyright. We're treading into interesting areas where AI just wrote a, a Decemberist song. We call him Malloy, he recorded it, but the technology exists to be able to take people's voices, translate those and use those voices with, with, with non, uh, uh, not their piece of music. We're treading into some really interesting places, and, and the legislation is trying to catch up with it. So I thought I'd end on the, I'm sorry, Dave. Hopefully this will work. Hello, hell, do you read me? So the top's a shot from a, a film in 1968. Oh, hell, do you read and me? I decided I'd try and avoid do you read me, hell? any copyright issues whatsoever. Day. So I got one of my colleagues who's far cleverer than me to fly through the script for 2000 Space Odyssey. Uh, Open the pod bay doors, hell. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid all of those I can't images. do that. That's the killer line. What's the problem? I think hopefully we caught up time. That was me. Thank you very much.